Welcome, wrestling fans, to this installment of Pro Wrestling Diary Shoot Interview Series. PW Diary does it big, and today is definitely no exception with a rare history in the making shoot interview. With us today is a former tag team champion, hardcore champion, the 1995 King of the Ring, Nelson Frazier. However, most fans know him well as King Mabel, Viscera, and recently Big Daddy V. Welcome. I'm glad to be here. It's truly an honor, my friend. This is an exclusive, and uh, this is the first time I've done this in my whole career, and I'm happy that you're doing it. There is, thank you very much, my friend. There is so much to cover. Uh, I want to get right in and ask you, uh, how old are you when you began following uh, professional wrestling? I would uh, say about three years old. Um, grew up in North Carolina, so the NWA was right there. Um, Andre the Giant, Bam Bam Bigelow was definitely one of my... Uh, inspirations in uh, Hulk Hogan to the Godfather. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, so yeah. at what age did you aspire to become a, a wrestler yourself? Seriously, I would say uh, whenever I got into the seventh grade, we had wrestling in our schools. Uh -huh. And uh, whenever I went to the ninth grade, that's when I started amateur wrestling and uh, taking it serious. And uh, whenever I uh, graduated high school, I went on to uh, pro wrestling school. The rest is history. So where did you uh, break in? I broke in in North Carolina. Uh, very hard to break in there for uh, a young black tag team, unknown. Um, there was a lot of times where we couldn't get work, not even for free, not even to learn how to do it. And so um, you can move on to other questions, and I'm sure that we'll go into that deeper. Who who trained you specifically? Was it uh, who in the school? Uh, Gene Anderson of the Minnesota oh, Wrecking Crew. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Men on a Mission were his last two students before he passed away. Okay. And um, he had an assistant. Uh, he was uh, called Rocky Anderson, an independent wrestler and uh, a real good friend of mine. I was going to get to that actually about uh, Mo. We'll speak about that in a moment. But uh, did you ever think about quitting? Did, was the bumps in the training, was it as hard as it looked on television watching these guys? Well, you know what? Up until... I actually made it big. I was having a blast. Mm -hmm. But whenever Vince McMahon, you know, put that straddle on you and uh, you're wrestling 280, 300 days a year, it's not so fun anymore. You know what I mean? It's more of a, a business, and um, you know, you miss being away from your family, and you know, of course, you're dealing with injuries and everything. So that kind of changed my my look it on it. Definitely takes a toll on on your body. Absolutely. Okay. Your first major bookings were in the Carolinas uh, for George South, correct? Um, actually, uh, we started first with uh, Willie Clay Promotions. Okay. And uh, that was in Concord, North Carolina. He was the first one to, to really give us a shot. We were called the Death Squad. That was our original name. Voodoo. You and Mo? Me and Mo. Okay. He was called Voodoo. I was Black Magic. Uh, we were called the Death Squad, and we wore masks. <laughs> and uh, so... Um, yeah, he was the first one to give us a shot, and then we moved on to PWF, which is George South Italian Stallion. What was your initial impressions of uh, meeting Mo? I thought he looked like Coco Beware. <laughs> <laughs> um, he really helped me because, uh, you know, they uh, put me through calisthenics and running and all that stuff, and, you know, I wasn't in the greatest shape. You know, I wasn't really into athletics as much as I should have as far as weights and cardio. I didn't really understand it, but I was wrestling. So um, he really helped me get through it and make it to get into school. And then he had a lot to do with my training, too. So I consider Mo one of my trainers, actually. I always give him credit for it. Okay. And then the, you were the Harlem Knights. Harlem Knights, man. That's, that's when uh, we went to um, Italian Stallion. Mm -hmm. We finally uh, got an opportunity to work for free, of course. Uh, it was like three nights a week, which was good. Uh, we uh, spent a little money, bought some good boots and good outfits or whatever, and uh, um, I'll never forget the first pictures we took. Uh, we had on the red and the, and the black, and I really thought we looked like a hell of a tag team, so I knew that we were going to make it, you know. And uh, We leaned on each other. We were repo men, you know, while we were trying to be wrestlers, and uh, never had a problem there. <laughs> All we had to do was just knock on the door and show them the papers, and they'd hand over the keys. Hey, guys, we had blonde mohawks at the time, you know, real crazy. But, you know, yeah, me and Mo went through a lot together, you know, and, and at the time we were really great friends. What did you uh, think of George uh, South as your manager? Um, 
George, I got a lot of respect for him at Stallion because, like I said, they gave us an opportunity to get good enough to make it to the big time. You know, they didn't pay us. They made a lot of money off us. We really lit their ter territory up. And it, uh, we basically dominated everybody for the longest. And then about the time we were going to leave, we were the tag team champions. And we finally got upset by uh, Italian Stallion and uh, GI, American GI, that's what it was called. And, uh, you know, we would have never left PWF. And uh, the only reason why we did, and I want to thank Stallion for this, we made a trip from Charlotte, North Carolina to somewhere in West Virginia. It was a long, dreadful trip. And we went to some small um, fire department, had a nice show or whatever. And we told Stallion, we're like, you know, hey, man, you know, he's never paid us at this point. Can we get a little gas money? And Stallion gave us $5 for the team. From that point, I looked at Mo. I said, F it, man. We're going to Memphis. We're going to Memphis, see if we can get discovered, see if we can go ahead and do this. Because uh, I, I took that, as much as I love George and Stallion, I took that as, as total disrespect, you know what I mean? You know, because we had built rapport with them at that point. Right. And um, so that basically was the reason why we made it. So you because, moved? Because of that $5. Yeah. Yeah. Was there any early uh, ribbing or hazing as a rookie, you and Mo? Oscar got it real bad. Oscar, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Vince used to tell me that the guys were afraid of me because I was young and kind of militant, you know, and I was basically bigger than a lot of the guys. And, you know, I guess, you know, they were a little afraid of me or whatever, you know. But, you know, I've grown up a lot since then. You know, I see the mistakes that I made. But as far as ribbing goes, they used to give Oscar hell. You mentioned uh, just now that uh, you, you and Mo moved to Memphis mm -hmm. uh, working for Jerry Lawler. What was that like? I have a lot of respect for Jerry Lawler, and I have a ton of respect for Jerry Jarrett because those are the two men that actually gave Harlem Knights the break to go to WWF at the time. Uh, we just showed up at one of their TV tapings one Saturday morning, uh, and I saw Jerry Lawler, and, and you know, he, he asked Mo, he said, who's that big guy behind you? You know, and they put us on TV that day and told us that they wanted us to go to Jonesboro the next night, you know. And so we, we thought we made it, you know. This is the USWA, so we were real excited about that. And 30 days later, we were in the WWF. The WWF, uh, you worked in the Carolinas, Memphis, and the ND scene, and uh, your extraordinary work got you and Mo actually, you know, noticed by the World Wrestling Federation in 93. When did you get the call? Who called you? Actually, it, uh, it, it was a funny situation how that happened, too. We were in an angle with the Moondogs, and uh, they had a giant Moondog. He was about my size, and I forgot what they called him, but he was a Moondog, and he was with the original Moondog, Larry, and uh, Spot, as everybody knows him. And um, so, like I said, I was young and militant, and, and I really weren't, wasn't taking care of guys the way I should, you know. And... Uh, he basically said, wrestling is too tough for me, I quit, I'm going back to Pennsylvania. And that's exactly what he did. So uh, the Harlem Knights really drove him out of the wrestling business. And then from that point, Jerry Jarrett had no choice. He was like, well, there's, I don't have anybody that can match up to you, you know. And so he said, well, let me see if I can get you a tryout match with WWF. Lo and behold, we got the tryout match. We went and we did our thing. You wrestled your trial match as the Harlem Knights. As the Harlem right. Knights. Right. The first night we went in as heels. And uh, we did our thing and the people, they cheered us, even though we were heels. So is that why they made you baby faces? That's why in? they tried right. the baby face thing. And, you know, that match didn't go as well that night. But I think we were pretty much in by that point because they knew that they had something there. But we didn't really know how to wrestle as good guys because we never had at that point. Is we were always a heel tag team until then. So when did you meet Oscar? You mentioned Oscar earlier. Was it with WWF, WWE? Yeah, now? actually Vince McMahon put Men on a Mission together. Um, Oscar uh, met Jerry Lawler and Vince McMahon on the elevator at one of the WrestleManias, a Toga WrestleMania. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, and, uh, 
he just said, hey, Vince McMahon, uh, Jerry Lawler, and he busted a freestyle rap right there in front of him. And Vince was impressed. And he gave him a card, and he said, if you got anything for me, you know, please, you know. And so Vince started looking for a black tag team, and about that time, here we come. How excited were you working now? How much pressure was it? It's a ton of pressure, you know. I mean, you're dealing with live TV. You're dealing with a lot of egos. You're dealing with, uh, you know, guys that do not want to look bad, you know. And uh, so, you know, there's a ton of pressure. You, you have to be mentally and physically strong to be a great professional wrestler. Describe the USWA WWE talent exchange. Um, it was very actually interesting because uh, it brought men on a mission in. It brought Jeff Jarrett in and Brian Christopher. You know, quite a few talents that, that really stood out in the WWE. I mean, a lot of guys go there, but then some guys just don't stand out. And all the guys that came from USWA did because they knew how to, to work the smaller crowds. If you could work the smaller crowds, the bigger crowds are a piece of cake. Absolutely. So what was your initial impression meeting Vince McMahon the first time? The first time I met Vince. <laughs> They flew us up to Connecticut, and we went into this uh, big office room with this huge table, gorgeous chairs, with J.J. Dillon. He sat us down. He's like, yeah, Vince is going to be here in a minute, you know, blah, 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 whatever. So, of course, you know, I mean, this is the man, you know. It doesn't get any higher than this. And so in he comes, man, and there he is, you know, all, you know, buffed up, and, you know, his hair was, you know, he wasn't a hair out of place, had on a little makeup, you know, came in and he was just so down to earth, man. And he sat there and he picked us all apart just by looking at us and, and he named us, you know, he told me my name last, you know, Mabel. <laughs> and that at the time I was like, man, my dream is coming true, but there's a catch. I'm, I'm named Mabel. I said, okay, here we go. Let's 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 work with it. You know what I mean? We're gonna make it happen. And now it's truly a household name. I can go to Germany, Australia, whatever, and people say, King Mabel, or Mabel, men on a mission. You know, it, it lives in people's hearts. Did you ever uh, think about giving him any ideas, like, but or maybe you were shy as a new guy coming in. Maybe you don't want to rock the boat. No, um, actually. I loved the Men on the Mission gimmick when it got started. You know, when we got a chance to, to work on it and polish it up. And then when I started dancing, that's when it really, Men on the Mission was, was hot, man. It really was. And uh, it, it was underutilized. Everybody knows that um, we could have been one of the greatest tag teams in, ever, you know. But, uh, you know, due to circumstances, you know, we did win the titles for three days, you know. But some guys never won the title, so at least we can say we did win them. What were your feelings of being pushed as baby faces as opposed to strong heels? It was a difficult transition for me because working for PWF, USWA, we were like the, the baddest heels that people have ever seen. It's like we came out of nowhere. And then, you know, when we got our job with WWF, Vince wanted to change it up. He, he wanted us to be... Uh, men from a mission that are trying to make a change in the ghetto, and it was a it was a hell of a concept. And they actually had vignettes at the time, which is kind of rare because usually vignettes are for heels as opposed to yeah. baby faces. Yeah, they paid play those vignettes for a while. It's like people was who are these guys? And then we finally came out, man. And like I said, it was kind of a difficult transition because I didn't really know how to be a baby face at the time. But as a little time went by and we started polishing it up, and like I said, when, when, when Mabel started dancing and really having fun with that gimmick, the whole world fell in love with Men on a Mission. That's why it'll never be forgotten. The tag team division in, in the WWE in 93 was at its peak. You had the Steiners, you had the Quebecers, the Head Shrinkers, Smoking Guns, Heavenly Bodies, Money Incorporated. Who out of those teams impressed you uh, upon your arrival? The Steiner brothers. Steiners. I was so glad that we were both babyface tag teams at the time because I didn't want to face the <laughs> Steiners, man. That was one team that, you know, I was kind of leery of because I knew that they were both collegiate wrestlers and, you know, they had a little chip on their shoulder, you know, whatever. But 
you know, Rick and Scott are cool, man, but, you know, I was glad that we were both baby faces at the time. <laughs> was there a lot of, like, uh, competition amongst the other tag teams? Um, yeah, I guess so. I mean, we were always playing games and joking in the back, you know. There was a, I mean, the back is a show in itself, you know. I mean, we do the show out front, but the real show is in the back. Right. Yeah. Memories of working with two great veterans in the sport, Ted DiBiase and Mike Rotunda, IRS. Mike Rotunda really taught me a lot, man, as far as psychology goes. He taught me how to do the most with the least. And at the time, I, I, you know, I was young and I wanted to do all this and that. And he was telling me, you know, don't, you don't, you don't need that much, you know, do it like this. And he really showed me, you know, how, how to wrestle and save your body. And, and as far as Ted DiBiase, um, went to my first big event with him and his wife and uh, Sue Etchison, WWE, Mo and uh, myself, uh, uh, Scott Levy was there, Raven. Uh, it was a big event we went to in New York. Uh, Ted has that picture in his house right now. You know, it was really a, a, a wrestling was really hot at the time. And, you know, we got to meet like uh, uh, all kinds of producers and, and you know, very uh, powerful people in entertainment, you know, and, and we represented WWE very good. That was a, that was a night I'll never remember, forget ever. Whose idea was it to wear the color purple? Like well, actually, uh, we were supposed to be men from a mission. So we we started with all different types of colors, just stuff just sewn together to look like garbage, you know, like we're, like we're dirt poor. And then we eventually, you know, went off into that. And I really don't know how the purple and gold started, but once it started, we just ran with it, you know? Because anything that worked at the time, while we were trying to mold that gimmick, we went with it. That's how I did with all my gimmicks. Did any of the racial elements bother you? Yeah, I thought the gimmick was uh, stereotypical and whatever, but, you know, I was just so happy to have an opportunity to do it, you know what I mean? And so I felt like uh, African Americans were glad just to see, you know, black people doing it, you know? So what is stereotypical, you know? It, it was a hell of an opportunity, we took it. Anyone in particular, like in this time, early 93, when you came to the WWE, was like a mentor towards you? You mentioned IRS helped you a lot, taught you a lot. And yeah, um, definitely one person that stands out. Uh, he gave me a scar over my eye here, Bam Bam Bigelow. We were married for a long time. Uh, they, we'd wrestle all around the world together, and one night he'd win, and the next night they'd have me win. And, and you know, we were just a good, like, mid-card match that people got into. And uh, he taught me a lot, man. It, he was amazing. You know, as, as far as a big man with agility, you got to give it up to Bam Bam. And it's actually uh, quite unique that uh, one of the guys grew, you grew up uh, idolizing is now, like, the opposite from you, or the opposition in your first pay-per-view, which is I want to get to the Survivor Series, 1993, at the Boston Garden. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, right. What are your memories on that? Like, and you weren't even scheduled on the card. What a dream come true. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, because Bam Bam was the guy that, I was like, wow, I like that. A big guy that can move. I mean, really move. That impressed me. And I wanted to be like him. And, and for me to make it in my first pay-per-view match was against him. It was like... And I pinned him. Right. <laughs> I mean, what what more could you ask for, man? Truly blessed, man. Did you travel at all with Bam Bam early in your career? No, I didn't. Um, I sure didn't travel with Bam Bam, but uh, of course we were on the road together. So you know, a lot of times I see him in bars and stuff. We were cool. We were cool. We had to be, man. We we worked each other every night forever. As years went on, uh, and today, in fact, there hasn't been much emphasis on the tag team division. Do you think that uh, tag teams can be marketable and sell tickets? Yeah, people used to really get into the tag team uh, uh, scenario and and the soap opera of it, if you will, you know. And a lot of people, a lot of wrestling fans prefer tag team wrestling because it's exciting. You know, if guys really know how to work it and, and milk the hot tag and everything, it's a formula that always works, and, 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 and I love it. I really love tag team wrestling more than singles. Madison Square Garden, WrestleMania 10, was that your first uh, show at Madison Square Garden? No, actually back then they used to run Madison Square Garden at least once a month. And so I, I did a couple house shows there before that, uh, quite a few actually, you know, before uh, WrestleMania 10.
But that was my first televised um, Madison Square Garden match. What was like the anticipation and the build up towards WrestleMania 10? What was the weeks and months leading up to it? What was that like? They had the uh, WWF fanfare where right. you could go in. It's like an amusement park. It's all wrestling. You know, what I mean, that was it was a lot of work, but it was fun. It was rewarding, you know, and. Uh, People just really love wrestling a lot more then than they do now. You know, I don't know what happened. You know, I mean, it's still hot, but back then it was just uh, it was just a special time back then. Do you think that's due to kayfabe? Like, how big was kayfabe then as it opposed to now? Um, I mean, it had already been announced that it was sports entertainment, but at the same time, people still wanted to believe, and we still tried to kayfabe a little bit. Like we wouldn't, like me and Bam Bam would never travel together because we always worked each other, you know what I mean? So we tried to protect the business as much as we could, man, but the internet was getting stronger and stronger and I think that hurt the business. Do you think uh, what also hurt the business is when Vince went on television and said that uh, we don't want to insult your intelligence, that this is sports entertainment and, you know? If anybody has the right to do that, Vince does. Right. Okay, so that's how I feel about that, you right. know, and it is what it is. I mean, any intelligent person would know that it's entertainment. So why not just say, okay, yeah, we are entertainment, right? you know, but at the same time, if you think that professional wrestling is any less of any other sport, you can ask any surgeon, he'll tell you that wrestlers go through the worst injuries, horrific injuries of any sport. Do you have any uh, stories of Andre? Have you ever met the man? Never met Andre, and um, I always did want to meet him, you know, but I never did meet him. What was the locker room vibe like when, when he passed? When Andre the Giant passed? Yeah. Um, everybody loved Andre, you know. He was like the undertaker, you know, of his era, and he like the cornerstone. And so, of course, man, I mean, it's... It's a very close-knit family, the WWF, you know, because you go through so much together going around the world and, you know, you're, you're each other's family, more than your family. So, of course, man, it hurt everybody. Everybody that knew him, I didn't know him. So, but it did hurt everybody. WrestleMania 10, let's get back to that. Uh, you wrestled the Quebecers, you and Mo. Was there any plans to have the straps? No, actually, unfortunately, um, that whole thing about us getting the titles and, and, and everything, it was all to end at WrestleMania just to get the Quebecers over, you know, and kind of get us over too because we won the match, you know, by count out, right. you know. So it was like a win-win a situation. And I had a blast. It was my first WrestleMania, man, and, hey, that, it was all good to me. A week later, uh, Men on a Mission wrestled the Quebecers, and, you actually won the titles. Is this true that you accidentally knocked out like Pierre of the Quebecers, and is that what instigated the title change? Uh, no, that that's totally false. What what had happened is when we won the titles in England, is that uh, when we were celebrating, uh, Oscar bust burst his head open with a belt some way, and that's what happened. I don't know how it turned into what you just said, but right. I've heard that before. And then you lost the titles back two days later. Was there any plan to have the titles longer? Like to have it in the States and maybe defend it on a couple uh, no, pay-per-views? No. no. I guess in a perfect world it would have been. But, you know, when politics play, man, you got you to gotta do what the boss says. Has the office ever told you that you would have a longer run with the belts? Or no. they, they told you flat out, hey, this is it? All we knew is that we showed up at the show in London and they say, hey, you guys are winning the titles tonight, but don't get too excited. You're dropping them two days later, you know. So it was, it, was, it was a good thing, man, overall. Your thoughts on the ladder match that Shawn Michaels and Scott Hall, Razor Ramon, had at WrestleMania 10? I always knew that Shawn and Razor were, I mean, two of the best we had to offer at the time. You know what I mean? That's why the Intercontinental Division back then was so hot because the best wrestlers were in the Intercontinental Division. And at that time guys that were smaller were, were held down to the Intercontinental Championship and the bigger guys were the ones that went out to the world. Is this title. a fair statement that among the boys that the Intercontinental title is more of the war, the workhorse belt? Back in the day we're going to, for the Intercontinental title like you know Ricky Steamboat, Kurt Henning, Randy Sean Savage. Michaels, Randy Savage, I mean the list goes on and on. 
Little Richard sung the national anthem at WrestleMania 10. You also had uh, Burt Reynolds, Jenny Garth, and a host of other celebrities as part of the main event at WrestleMania 10. Do you don't forget Little Richard. Oh, no. You don't <laughs> care, no. He sung the national anthem. Yeah. Um, do you feel that the celebrities have a place in professional wrestling? Yeah, because it's all entertainment, and we're all characters, you know, so it's like we already have something in common once we meet each other, you know, and it's, it's always a fun time to see people in other forms of entertainment. Some performers uh, dislike celebrities in the sense that they don't want them to be in the ring wrestling, like it's an insult that, you know, you've trained for so long and paid your dues that somebody mm -hmm. else is coming in who's celebrity is coming for a one-shot deal. Mm -hmm. What about as a celebrity uh, to have a match in the ring? Um, I can't say that I agree with it. I mean, I, I know it's totally f financial thing or whatever, but um, I, I don't agree with it, and I think that, you know, wrestlers should should be the ones exclusively wrestling. Right. You, have to, you should be trained, and, and it, it should be a passion of yours. Your memories of Yokozuna? <laughs> the only other big, smooth guy I've ever known. <laughs> Rodney and Noy, man, tons of respect for him, had so much fun with him on the road. He was always like, I mean, pound for pound, he's the most impressive big man that's ever been. You know, he just, I know how it feels like for guys to be in the ring with me being in the ring with Yokozuna, because you're like, gee, this guy could fall and break my leg, and you know, it's scary, you know, so I know why guys look the way they do when I'm stepping over the top rope. <laughs> You mentioned uh, you're on the road with him quite a lot. Any road stories you could share with, with Yokozuna? Yoko was a big party. He was always the one. He actually used to drag me out of my room because I used to like to stay in my room. You know what I mean? I, I wasn't a big drinker, but back then it was a prerequisite to go out and drink with the boys. You know what I mean? And uh used to go out and Undertaker used to buy the, the, the big huge thing of, of double shots right. of, of Jack Daniels and he'd sit there and make sure that you drank your fair share and you stagger out of there and, and try to make the next show the next day and you gain just a little bit more respect because there was a lot of guys that, that couldn't hang you know it's like a rite of passage how sad are, were you of his passing very sad very very sad um, he went too early but you know Back then, we didn't have the wellness program, but we did have, uh, you know, EKGs or whatever. And, and the doctor that used to perform them, he used to always tell me that Rodney had a bad heart. So he always had a bad heart. You know, what an amazing athlete, you know what I mean? But when he died, I cried. I cried, man. I cried like I lost a brother. And where did you hear it? Like, where were you? I was watching Raw, and it came up on the screen. That's how I found so you out. found out with everybody else. That's right. Speaking of Yoko, his manager, Mr. Fuji, is a notorious uh, ribber. Did you ever encounter Mr. Fuji pull <laughs> ribs he indirectly? Is classic. Yeah. He is classic. Uh, the only one that that could even come close to to Mr. Fuji would be Owen Hart. But Mr. Fuji, he's like one of the best ribbers of all time, man. And you can't get mad because it's you know it's, it's Mr. Fuji. You know, fun times. Very fun times back then. I mean, we weren't making as much money as later on, but I mean, we made up for it at night, man. We had fun. Can you give us one rib that Mr. Fuji has pulled that you've saw? Man, there's so many. But one of his his main things was uh, shaving off eyebrows. You know, <laughs> on the he, on the plane. He'd get guys. He'd get them wherever you were. You know, passed out or whatever you wake up with no eyebrows. And it, it used to be the funniest thing in the world, but you know, yeah, Mr. Fuji was a lot of fun on the road, man. Do you prefer working with big guys like yourself or, or the smaller guys? Absolutely prefer the David versus Goliath because it always works, it's so easy, you know, and it's, it's I, was, I just had a match with Kevin Nash a few weeks ago and uh, we were d discussing it, how we as big guys can have better matches with smaller guys like Shawn Michaels or whatever because it's, it just makes for a better match. It's like there's not so much you can do with uh, like a Kevin Nash versus Big Daddy V. I mean, he'll, he'll never powerbomb me, you know what I mean? So it's, it's, it just makes it a little bit more difficult. Around uh, 1994 is like we're on. What are your thoughts of Bret the Hitman Hart as world champion? <laughs> 
This might be a, a little, you know, I don't know, it's just my opinion, but I worked under the man and I think that he was the best champion of all time. I mean, as far as international rapport, it's like he's a god, man, in other countries. You know, people used to follow us around like we were the Beatles back then. I tell, you know, the younger guys about it now and, and all they can do, like, really? It was like that? And it was truly like that. Truly like that. Working under Bret Hart was, was some of the best times of my life, man. Other performers have also said, too, when they worked with Bret Hart, that he was a guy in there that took care of you, that never, like, hurt you. He was yeah, and he was a leader. He was a true leader, man. You know, he, he was one of the, uh, the guys, the only guys to ever stand up and, and uh, say something about the no marijuana, you know. He said, uh, you know, you mean to tell me I can't? do what I want to do in my own home. I mean, he stood up in a meeting and did that. Now, that's a leader. How serious do you think he took himself as far as being a role model? Brett the Hitman Hart. It was, it, was, it was real to him, you know. Um, he, he was a hero, man. I mean, you know what I mean? He took it to heart, you know. Brett was, Brett's a guy that, that commands respect, you know what I mean? And the kids loved him, and, you know, he did his thing, man. God bless Brett. The 94 King of the Ring is where you got your first taste of the King of the Ring. Yeah. You wrestled in more singles matches. Your match with uh, Mike Rotunda, yeah. IRS. Yeah. Then you wrestled at SummerSlam 94 with uh, Jeff Jarrett. Mm -hmm. uh, describe, describe those matches. Um, the transition from tag team to singles. It, it was it was kind of difficult because it's a whole other ball game. You know, you can't tag out and, you know, get your breath, you know what I mean? You got to strategically plan where am I going to put a spot in there where I can breathe, you know what I mean? But you're always on, so it was totally different. It was it was harder. I noticed that I needed to be in better cardiovascular shape at that point, too. But uh, I think I did a good job, man. You know, that was my first time, you know, and, uh, you know, wrestling IRS, like I said, he, he was always teaching me how to do less with more. You know, and uh, he was telling me a funny thing uh, that night. I was like, man, I'm getting eliminated in the first round. He was like, well, hell, I got to work twice. <laughs> and still not winning. So, you know, he's just, he's just real smart. And as far as Jeff, you know, I, you know, I'd wrestled Jeff back in the USWA. You know, we was good friends and everything. And they were pushing him at the time. He was supposed to have that match with Doink, you know, because they built up the right. whole time with him, you know, you know, doing things to Dink and whatever, and at the last minute, they changed it to Mabel, you know, and uh, I just went ahead and, you know, put him over. You wrestled periodically for the USWA in the summer of 94. Mm -hmm. You wrestled with Sid in uh, a lot of matches, unification bouts. Sure did, because I was living in Nashville at the time, and uh, like you said, they had a good rapport between them at the time, so, I mean, it's, an, it's a no-brainer. <laughs> He's right there, you know, and uh, Sid's in Memphis. Let's hook him up. Right. What was the locker room like when Hulk Hogan uh, signed with WCW? Like, with mm -hmm. Vince McMahon or the, the, the boys? Well, um, it was an exciting time. That was very exciting because, you know, Vince and Hogan together made wrestling what it is. And so when one party goes somewhere else and, you know, hey, then you, you feel like you have two titans there, you know. And that's the way it turned out to be. Did you see an opportunity with Hulk there, the void, that here, um, uh, there's a spot now I could elevate myself? You know what, before I ever got my tryout match with uh, WWF, uh, when uh, we were working with Italian Stallion, he got us a tryout for WCW at the time. And that was my only match I ever had with WCW. And v Van Vader was the champion at the time. And um, the vibe, in that locker room for this young black tag team was not nearly as professional as the WWF. And so whenever we got our tryout with WWF and saw how professional they were, you know, never wanted to be anywhere else. Never wanted to be anywhere else. Vince McMahon was put on trial in 1994, accused of distributing steroids to his wrestlers. Although he escaped jail time and the, the jury found him not guilty, like what was the, what was the vibe in the locker room at this point? 
That was tense. That was kind of a tense moment, man. But everybody was trying to make light of it. You know, Vince was really scared. He thought he was going to jail. And I never thought, that, you know, I'll never forget the time we were at the bar. And uh, Undertaker was there. Vince was there. You know, we was having drinks. And uh, Undertaker started singing, That's the sound of the men working on the chain. Mm -hmm. And Vince just laughed. And everybody laughed. So, And he got off. So I was there, man. And that was a rough time for him. But he got through it, man. God bless him. He beat the government. Hulk Hogan is already with WCW. Uh, end of November, Randy Savage signs with WCW now. Did you see like uh, the tide shifting now that WWE is having competition with Turner and WCW? You know what? I truly do not see WWE really ever having competition because their formula is, is, is so superb and it's so sharp and so consistent. It's like everybody else is just like a, a, a sad imitation. This is what I really want to discuss. The year of King Mabel, 1995. In early 95, you and uh, Mo turned heel on your friends, the Smoking Guns. And uh, this was actually a week before WrestleMania 11. Mm -hmm. You turned on Oscar, you turned on the Smoking Guns. Tell us, uh, when did you find out that you were going to turn heel? Well, actually, um you know, uh, I told Vince that, that, you know, we wanted to do something different. You know, uh, we had went through the whoop, there it is, we went on a mission, right. and that had gotten old. The song had played out on the radio and everything, and I had did the singles thing for a minute. And uh, so that war took its course. And so I told Vince, I said, we want to do something new. And uh, he told me then, we're going to turn your heel, you know. We're going to get you the king of the ring, and he kept his word. What were the plans for Oscar beyond this angle? I mean, he looked like he faded out of the picture. Yeah, um, they basically wanted to get him out of there. He he had a lot of heat on him. You know, he never, ever learned respect for our business because he, he gained it so easily. He didn't go through the independence until after he got fired from WWF, and then he learned to respect it, you know, but it was too late by that point, you know. If he would have just respected the business, you know, and, and been a learner and not so much of a loud mouth, then he'd have probably still been there today, man. You mentioned he got ribbed uh, quite a few times. Is this, is this why? Like, yeah. Like, they see him as some guy who didn't respect the business? Yeah, that was the reason why he was getting ribbed. I mean, uh, he, uh, he told uh, Steve Lombardi, you know, we were having a match with him, and, and, and they got into some kind of altercation, the verbal. And he told Steve Lombardi, I have you uh, floating in a river somewhere. Oh. That's Steve Lombardi. It's a cornerstone of, of the company, I mean. Absolutely. So he was an idiot, man. You know, I, I have nothing against Clemmy, Gerard, that's his mm -hmm. name. You know, but uh, he blew his opportunity, you know, and I think he knows that. What happened to Oscar? Oscar went on to uh, become a radio host in Chicago. That was the last that I heard. I haven't talked to him. I haven't talked to him since he left. Your memories of your one-minute squash match versus Adam Baum at the very first in your house. Yeah, that was, um, they they really just wanted to get that over with. They, they only gave us so much time. And uh, as we were trying to go out through the curtain, we were still discussing what we were trying to do. And, you know, we could have had a, a way better match if they had gave us more time, but pay-per-view restraints, so. What they were, they were actually giving away a house that that evening. Yeah, they, they yeah. did too. They made somebody really happy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, did you sense that this is the push now that you're getting? That now they're making you like the the monster heel. Yeah, like I said, Vince told me that he was going to turn me heel, and he was he was going to do something with me, and it was happening. You know, so I I was happy for that. Yeah. And actually, you wrestled Adam Bomb weeks later as you're qualifying for the King of the Ring in '95. Mm -hmm. And uh, you went on to the King of the Ring pay-per-view. You defeated The Undertaker, which is Say that huge. one more time. You defeated The un King Mabel, defeated The Undertaker. I was the first the one the to ever pin him in the center of the ring, one, two, three. Yokozuna beat him in a casket match, but it took 15 guys to put him in the casket. That was going to be my next statement. You were the first one to beat him. Yeah. And, uh, and you received an automatic buy into the finals as a result of Shawn Michaels and... Uh, Kama, who's later on The Godfather, went mm -hmm. Broadway. Right. 
And uh, meanwhile, Savio Vega wrestled four times that night, and uh, the crowd in Philly just went unlit when, yeah. when you defeated him. Poor just, Savio, yeah. right? <laughs> what a story, you know? He had to wrestle four times, and, you know, he got just there and just couldn't get it done. You know, what a story. But that made the people really love him a lot more then, but that just made them hate me. I was one of the, the, the biggest heels that a lot of the old-timers said they've seen in many years. When did you know that you were going to win the King of the Ring? Uh, Royal Rumble. I had to talk to Vince, and he told me he's going to turn me heel and give me the King of the Ring, and he kept his word. He's always kept his word with me. Your memories of the crowd in Philadelphia that night. <laughs> <laughs> and the amount of heat you generated. It was everything I could do to keep from laughing. Uh -huh. Because they were so mad and they were just throwing stuff at me. And then one guy threw a, a can and it hit me dead center in the eyes and everybody just popped. Yeah. And, uh, During the coordination. Yeah, yeah, and I just had to stay in character, you know. But I wanted to laugh too, you know what I mean? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, man, Philly, man, they're, they're always... A, an energetic crowd, man, and I love going to Philly. So tell us more about your feelings that now, like, I'm going to follow in Bret Hart, Owen Hart's footsteps, win the King of the Ring, the yearly annual King of the Ring. Yeah. What, what, what was your feelings? Well, I wanted to actually be a king. Everybody else just, you know, okay, I've, I'm the king, but, you know, I'm not the king. I wanted to be the king, so I, I had the crown, I had the turban, I had the the, the sedan, and... Uh, Jeff Hardy and Matt Hardy carrying me. I mean, hell, I was the man. Uh, the Hardy boys actually used to carry King Mabel to the ring a time or two, you know. <laughs> and uh, it's it's ironic, man, because look what they've accomplished. Right. Yeah. Reggie Parks created the belt for the King of the Ring. This is the first time King of the Ring has ever had a belt made. What was the thought process behind uh, the creating the belt? Well, uh, you know, with the king of the ring, you get the crown, you know, and, uh, you know, I made a big deal about my crown, but I, I always thought that, you know, hey, maybe they should, it was an annual event at the time, why not pass the belt every year? So I just used my creative mind and, and my commercial arts and I drew it out and Reggie brought it to life exactly the way I drew it. Speaking of commercial arts, you majored in that, is that correct? Yeah, four years of commercial arts, man, in high school as, as when I was wrestling too. So I was either going to be a professional wrestler or a commercial artist. And, you know, as I started to grow and get bigger and I'm looking down on everybody's head, you know, I said, I can be a wrestler. So now it's King Mabel and Sir Mo. Yeah. And now you're feuding with uh, Razor Ramon, Scott Hall, and Savio, and 123 Kid. Yeah. You had a tag team match with uh, Savio and Razor at the July in your house. Actually, you got a tremendous amount of heat on you when Razor had to tape the ribs. Yep. Describe the match at uh, July in your house. I thought it was a hell of a match. Um, I took the big flare bump off the top rope, and uh, Mo did his big moonsault that night because uh, we just felt like that was our opportunity to shine. And it was in Nashville, and we were both living in Nashville at the time. So we went out there and we tore it up, man. We had a good match, too. The same night as uh, the July in your house in Nashville, you were one of the lumberjacks. They even had a spot where Shawn Michaels jumped off the top rope, yeah. and uh, all the heels fell except for one man, and it was you, King Mabel. Right. So was this the writing on the wall we were going to see? You got to have uh, Monster King Mabel. Yeah, they were, they were just trying to really build me up and make me stand out in the crowd and uh, show me as a threat to Diesel. You know, somebody who he could not jackknife powerbomb on his best day. So. It was good, you know. People were intrigued by it. Now you're in the main event for the number one contender, uh, SummerSlam 95 against Diesel, Kevin Nash. How, how excited were you now that this is going to be your first World Heavyweight title uh, match and mm -hmm. the build-up going into it, pay major pay-per-view, SummerSlam? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell us about it. It was awesome, you know. I mean, it, it doesn't get any bigger than that, you know what I mean? Uh, actually, uh, me and Kevin Nash at the time were, were lobbying for uh, Shawn Michaels and Razor to go on last because we knew they were going to outshine us, a ladder match, you know, whatever, and, and Vince was like, absolutely not, the world title must go on last. So, I mean, we did it, man. I mean, Kevin and myself, you would have to see us in person to, to really, you know, respect how large we are. And for us to be able to move like that and, and do that match like that, it's, it's, it's incredible. Describe uh, working with Kevin Nash in that match, like you just touched on. 
Um, it was a good match. Um, you know, we had a spot in there, a spot or two that didn't go as as planned, but uh, we uh, we finished the match, and it was a good match. And uh, you know, I saw Kevin Nash uh, about three weeks ago for the first time in 15 years, and uh, we caught up, man. We ate sushi all day. We had a couple delayed flights, and you know, it was great, man. It was good seeing Kevin again, man. I want to rewind uh, the the weeks leading up to SummerSlam. It was actually unique because there was a tag match involved, and you actually turned Davy Boy Smith heel. Oh yeah, that was monumental, man. Because uh, Davy Boy, he was like uh, Ricky Steamboat. You know, he was a, a, a consummate babyface. White babyface. Yeah, yeah, and uh, when he joined uh, King Mabel, that shook the world. Huh. It was hot. It was hot. I was glad to be a part of that. Were you disappointed with how the match went down at SummerSlam? Um, I felt like it would have been better for me to be the champion and then let Diesel chase and, you know, eventually beat me again. I thought that that would really have, uh, have cemented my legacy or whatever. But, you know, uh, Vince wanted him to kill a monster. And at the time, there was no bigger monster than King Mabel, so I had to do my job. Was there ever any plans to have the world title? Did Vince ever promise you? He never promised that. He never did. He never said that. He said the king of the ring. He never said anything else. People describe Vince McMahon's uh, big man fetish. It's, uh, you know, other wrestlers have said in other interviews, common knowledge. What is your opinion on that? Well, it's true. Yeah. You know, everybody loves the big guy, Bigger not just Vince. Yeah, not yeah. just Vince. There's a lot of people out there, man, that like big people, of course. So. I mean, why should why should he be singled out? You like, oh, he has a big man fetish. There's a lot of sexy women that like <laughs> big men too, you know. I want to go back to uh, SummerSlam. There was a run-in involved with Lex Luger, but uh, a week later we saw Luger on the first Nitro from the Mall of America, head to head with Raw. Yeah. Do you think that they wouldn't had Luger run in? Maybe the outcome of the match would have been different had Luger not have jumped. Well, they had big plans on, you know, Luger, you know, us going against the Allied Powers. They had big plans for that. And and that was the birth of the 90-day clause. Lex Luger is the reason why we have the 90-day clause, because they didn't want anybody else to pull a stunt like that, man. And that, and he was going on, on good faith at the time, and, and he, he really, you know, that was kind of underhanded, man. Jim you Ross know. said on television that he broke his word, that he had a handshake agreement, exactly. and then he left. Exactly, and so after that happened, the 90-day clause was a must. Was this the beginning? Then you had Medusa, what she did? Well, Intelligent go out as women's champion on Nitro, throw the belt in the trash? Yeah, I mean, that's, again, man, that's something that I would never do because I have so much respect for all the McMahons and what they've done for me and my family. And so I would never spit in their face like that. That is totally disrespectful, and I disagree with it. How big of a mistake of it was on her part to burn her bridge like that with the company? Look at her career now. There's your no answer. There. Yeah. Why hasn't there been a rematch for the title with Diesel? Um, I don't know. I think that was just all the build just to give Diesel that big win, and then they wanted to move on to something else, you know what I mean? But at the same time, you know, I got my push, and, and the process is totally business, you know what I mean? That's, that's how wrestling is. They build up one person just to ultimately get this guy over, okay, and that's what that was. So did you know coming in that this was only going to be one match? main event for the title, SummerSlam, and that was I mean, it. There, there was no promises either way, you know, it, it, so I, I didn't know what to expect. So what, was there any plans, like, for you, to, what, well, he as the champion is moving on, like, what were your plans now? Like, where do you go from there? Well, I think at the time Vince had thought about reestablishing Men on a Mission as a tag team, but um, at the time, uh, my relationship with Robert Horn wasn't uh, all that great. So now here's the big question that everybody wants to know. So here we go. Drum roll. <laughs> <laughs> Why did Men on a Mission break up? Why did Men on a Mission break up? I go all around the world wrestling to this day, and, and there's always a handful of fans that come up to me and ask about Mo, who love Men on a Mission, you know, and really want to know, you know, you know, why you guys aren't together, what, what the deal was. 
Uh, whenever I won the King of the Ring, um, I guess Moba came jealous of me. I was young at the time when he displayed an attitude towards me. I displayed an even bigger attitude towards him, and so our relationship crumbled. We were so tight. We were tight like brothers. We lived together. We partied together. We traveled together. Everything, and uh, the King of the Ring win for me was really the start of the end of our relationship because you know I mean we started from the very beginning together and we made it to the top of the biggest company and it's like they put so much emphasis on King Mabel and he was like Sir Mo and they really treated him bad too in, in the back as far as respect and everything and you know I don't blame him you know for getting that way towards me you know what I mean it's, it's a lot of pressure you know it's an everyday grind and you know by him you know displaying the attitude and me being young and not knowing how to deal with that at the time you know that's why we're not nearly as close as we used to be although we still have love for each other and we still do keep in touch from time to time I want to get that in there so what is uh, Mo doing today he's driving trucks and he's uh, he uh, promotes uh, indie wrestling shows from time to time, you know. But uh, that's what he's doing. He's doing well. How hurt were you that, like, at your success, like, you know, being young, like, he couldn't handle seeing you getting the big push, being successful, like, you know, you guys are like brothers, like you say. I was at the time. I was trying to explain to him. He was getting five thousand dollars a pay per view just to stand on the outside of the ring while I wrestled. Of course I was getting a lot more, okay? But that's $5,000 for doing nothing. You're saving your body. Why are you concerned with how much money I'm making? You know what I mean? Right. And so that that was basically the demise of, of Men on the Mission. It was, you know, the, the company put me on a pedestal and kept him down there, and then it frustrated him, and there you have it. You're, you worked with The Undertaker the remainder of that year. Uh, three of the four in your the, the the following three in your houses and the Survivor Series you were uh, captains of your respective teams. Yeah. What are your thoughts of the Undertaker early in your career at this point? Early in my career. Yes. Um. Early in my career, um, I don't know. I guess my 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 memory of Undertaker is just being a leader. You know, being a leader in the locker room and in the bar and, you know, a mysterious leader, though. You know, he was uh, he was always, you know, with the boys or whatever, but he, he still did his own thing. So, you know, he displayed that early uh, that leadership early in his career. Always from the time I've known him. He's always been a leader, always, you know, and um, he's always been able to relate to all different facets of wrestlers. You know what I mean? And, um, yeah, he's always been a leader, man. It's, I mean, they're trying to make it seem like it's something new, but he's always been a leader of the locker room. They had you job uh, those times with The Undertaker, never let you beat him back. Like, do you think this was retaliation because he lost to you at the King of the Ring? Well, yeah, they, they had to build him back up, right. you know. And uh, it's all good, man. I mean, he's The Undertaker. I mean, you can't kill the dead. <laughs> You even had an angle where um, you leg dropped him, and he had it like you almost like broke his face in the storyline, and he had to wear a phantom-like mask. Right. Actually, what happened is um, a move got botched in a house show, and I accidentally hit the Undertaker in the eye with my fist with a flying clothesline. I broke his orbital bone, so um, definitely I got a lot of heat for that. It was a total accident. And uh, he had to come back and wear the mask for a while. And ironically, whenever I left WWF and I came back, me and Undertaker were allies. You know, we would form the Ministry of Darkness. So, you know, like I said, I, I had a lot of growing up to do back then. And, uh, you know, I still needed to learn how to protect guys better, too, you know, so. Your final high-profile match with the WWE and, and your first run was ironically against Diesel, Kevin Nash, mm -hmm. at the Raw Bowl, uh, January 1, 1996. Um, did you see the writing on the wall that that something bad was going to happen soon? That well, yeah, 
you can kind of feel it, you know. Uh, guys that have been there before and done that, they, they know what I'm talking about. You know, it's, it's like a, a eerie feeling glooming over your shoulder, and there's nothing you can do about it but just ride it out until it, you know, finally happens. So was Mo released uh, first, or like there's speculation that he was released first, or were you released together? We were released together. Yeah, we were released together, and I, I think that was a company's way of really just getting me away from him, you know, and letting me grow up a little bit, and then bring me back, and that's what they did. When did you find out? Uh, after the uh, the Royal Rumble 1996, uh, Vince just didn't come out and say it, but you know he he said that well I don't have you guys booked on anything you know and we had never heard that before uh, you know what I mean and so shortly thereafter we we received the paperwork in the mail. What was most feelings with management at this time? Like I said, he was very bitter at the time because of my success. And uh, he was more concerned with my bank account than his own, and and, and our relationship at that time was just, uh, it was on its last legs. It was really on life support. So you think it was like bittersweet that, you know, you got the big break, it's great, you're, you're in the WWE with Mo, but now all of a sudden it drew a wedge between you. I lost my best friend. Do you still keep in touch with Oscar? You know, I, I haven't spoken to Oscar uh, since he left WWF. But uh, like I said, I heard he was uh, a, a radio guy now, and he's doing okay. So. After you got released, did WCW ever call? Um, actually, I was talking to Bischoff for a minute, you know, about going into uh, WCW, but. Uh, it just didn't pan out, and and I was glad that it didn't because you know I'm a, a WWE guy, and I mean people see me, that's what they think about. They don't think about oh I've been here, I've been there, I've been everywhere. You know what I mean? So I I like that. I like being exclusive. You know, a lot of those guys that did jump ship, man, I think it lowered their stock a little bit. You know, as opposed to to staying like you know the Undertaker did. You know what I mean? Discuss what a great year 1995 was in terms of the money, the recognition, being a main event player for the WWE. Yeah, a lot of pressure. You're lonely at the top. You got a bullseye on your back. Everybody wants your spot. Your best friend will turn against you. And that's what happened to me, you know. So, I mean, it's bittersweet when you make it to the top, you know. Uh, and uh, my hat's off to the guys that, that, that stay there, you know. But it's... it's you got to be mentally tough, man. And they don't serve room, they don't, uh, serve room service at the end of the night either. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so you, there's a lot of different factors that go into it. You know, you're going to be leaving the arena late and all kinds of stuff, you know, so. In 96, you accepted bookings for Carlos uh, Colon, uh, working with Puerto Rico at the World Wrestling Council. Ironically, uh, the World Wrestling Council is rival of the IWA, the International Wrestling Alliance. And they, and they had a talent exchange with uh, Vince. Mm -hmm. So uh, tell us like what it was like working with Carlos. And uh... It was great for me because the Puerto Rican fans believed. Back then, they truly believed. I mean, I heard they're a lot smarter now, but back then they believed. And, and whenever I pinned Carlos and I took the universal title, I had to escape the arena, you know, literally. You know, they were throwing... Mm -hmm. uh, bottles and, and, and batteries and pouring beer on me. I mean, hitting me with belts, everything. But I loved it. After Bruiser Brody was stabbed to death in the shower in Puerto Rico, this was years before, uh, for allegedly a number of reasons, whether it was a refuse to do a job or... Uh, nonetheless, a lot of the American talent, including Mick Foley, apparently vowed never to work in Puerto Rico again. Hmm. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that situation? All I know is that when I was working over there, you know, I, you know, did a little work with the guy uh, that, that, that committed the murder. And uh, I just said I kept my eyes on him. I put it like that. You know, it was kind of, 
it's kind of weird, you know, working with somebody that, that would do something like that, you know. It, what kind of person would do that, you know, so. And he was still working there when this. He was, he was there, yes, he was. He was acquitted, was. actually. Yes, yeah, and he was there, so. You mentioned in Puerto Rico the fans were rowdy. They actually believed back then that wrestling was real. Uh, there's a lot of stories of fans getting out of hand. Um, what else can you share with us regarding, like, Puerto Rico? Have you ever seen anything very scary that maybe. Um, I mean, as far, I mean, I heard all kinds of stories. But as far as my personal experience, whenever I won the Universal title from Carlos, it's like just to see how seriously they took it and how they were really trying to hurt me with those objects, it's like, man, these people really believe. So that that's my experience. And not many people know this, but you worked with uh, Carlos's son, uh, now WWE superstar Carlito. Um, what was it like working with him then? Carlito, he's he's truly cool, you know. It's <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a gimmick, but it's not, you know. We call him Briz, you know. Briz is cool, man. He's he's a good friend of mine. Any differences with between then and now? Was he green then, but now he's? I don't know, man. I always thought that uh, Carlito was destined for greatness. You know, he's a hell of a worker, man. He's got a a good personality, you know, and and kids love him too. So you know. I think the best is yet to be seen with Carlos and Primo. Speaking of Primo, do you have any memories of his younger brother? Uh, actually, uh, I've never met Primo face to face. So, I mean, I'm sure if he's anything like his brother, he's cool. So, you know, I see him down the line. Your thoughts on Carlos Colon as a promoter and booker? Um, tons of respect. I mean, how many people can say that they've had an organization for that long? You got to be doing something right, and I mean he draws big houses sometimes too, man. So, I mean, hey, my hats off to him. You think he pushed his sons to follow in his footsteps? Of course, you know it, it takes Carlito to tell you uh, some of the stories about you know how he pretty much had to wrestle. You know, it, it was no choice. You know, that, that's the family business. So, yeah. He wrestled in Puerto Rico and then uh, he went back to the states. Is that correct for Memphis? Yeah. Back yes. to the USWA. Yes. Uh, you defeated Brian Christopher for the USWA title, and two months later, Jerry Lawler won the title from you. Right. What are your thoughts of being a USWA champion? I mean, it was a dream come true as well. I mean, it happened a little bit later than I wanted to, it to you know, happen. Right. You know, I would have loved to have been the champion when I first went there, but, I mean, you know, USWA has a lot of heritage there, and, and to be the, the USWA champion is, uh, hey, it's a feather in my cap. Was there any heat between Lawler and his son, Frank Christopher? Uh, not that I know of. Uh, as far as I know, they're, they're a loving father and son. In 1996, the USWA folded. Talk about the big crowds that the USWA used to draw on Monday nights, in spite of Monday Night Football. And then later on, they had the Monday Night Wars, Raw and Nitro going at it. Uh, do you think they suffered, that they were a casualty part of the Monday Night Wars? Absolutely, man. Absolutely, because Monday night in Memphis, anybody that knows will tell you, I mean, it's hot, you know. Everybody was at the Mid-South Coliseum. I mean, huge crowds, man. People really enjoying it, you know. And, um, yeah, it, it, it was it was suffered, you know, definitely. Do you have any uh, memories of J.C. Ice, Wolfie D? <laughs> uh, I'll probably I'll say J.C. Ice is one of the craziest guys I know. <laughs> And Wolfie D used to be too, but when he had his daughter, he got his head on straight, and he's doing good. But uh, I like both those guys, man. They're a ton of fun. Did you sense any time while you're on the indie scene that, that Vince or WWE call you to come back? Uh, no, actually, I didn't. We didn't have any contact until I called them uh, back in uh, '99. And, uh, you made a brief appearance in. Uh, it was ironically yeah, after the right. King of the Ring you're with right. uh, Ken Shamrock. You're right. Raw. You're right. They called me for that. You're right. right. I forgot all about that. And they uh, they wanted me to do a match with Ken, in which I did a good match and everything. And they were like, you know, we'll probably have something for you a little what, down the line. And shortly after, they called me with the uh, ministry uh, offer. That was actually yeah, like about a year later. Yeah. Uh, at the end of 98, um, you made a rare appearance for ECW's pay-per-view, November to Remember, mm -hmm. as part of the, the full-blooded Italians, the right. FBI. Yeah. 
Uh, what was the locker room atmosphere like in ECW? <laughs> the best locker room of all time. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, I mean, Paul Lee was great to work for. You know what I mean? He, he pretty much let you be who you are, you know? And everybody talks about he bounces checks and all of that. Mine didn't bounce, so thanks, Paul. I guess you like me. What was your payday for uh, November to remember? I don't usually talk numbers, but I will say it was multiple thousand dollars and the check didn't bounce. Okay. Did Paul ever offer you anything else besides a one-shot deal? No, he didn't because, I mean, he paid me very well for November to remember. And at the time, I mean, he, he owed his guys all kinds of money and everything. I mean, they, you know, it, it wasn't really a good situation, so I didn't really want to, you know, be a part of that, you know, not to that extreme where, you know, it's every week I'm with ECW. Uh, a couple months after the 1999 Royal Rumble, you made your comeback, your second run with uh, the WWE. Good. They, did they call you at this time, or this is the time where... Yeah, they called me uh, with the, the ministry offer, and they told me how they wanted to set it up and have me come in as a part of the corporation first to help out The Rock with Mick Foley. And then uh, at the Rumble, they were going to have The Undertaker capture my soul. Right. And uh, they told me they wanted me to bleach my hair back blonde and put in some white contacts. Oh. And yeah, and Viscera was born, the ministry Viscera. Did you get a sense that this was going to be a long-term gig, a long-term deal? Um, I don't, I didn't really know, you know. All I knew was that, you know, the people liked it a lot, and, um, and it was going good, but I didn't know as far as how, I didn't think it would be like a, a destiny or anything, or a dynasty or anything. Whose idea was it for the, the bleached mohawk, the black bodysuit, the, the white contacts? Well, when I first went to WWF, I had the blonde mohawk already, you know, so I did that on my own and got rid of it. And then they wanted me to bring it back with the white contact, so that's basically Vince's idea. What was the locker room like as opposed to the, your last run? Now you had Steve Austin on top as opposed to Bret Hart was on top in the first run. The money was flowing, man. You know, uh, house shows were sold out. People were sitting but behind the Titan Tron that couldn't see the ring. They just wanted to be in the ring, in the arena, you know, when Rock and Stone Cold were on top. I mean, it, it was a good time. The Attitude Era was hot. Your thoughts on Stone Cold Steve Austin? Steve is uh, that's very serious about his business and very passionate, you know. And uh, I got a ton of respect for him, man. I made a lot of money working under him. Austin feuded with your group, the ministry, a lot. Yeah. What was it like working with uh, Steve at his highest peak? <laughs> funny story I have about Steve, well the funniest story I have about Steve is one time the ministry was going to attack him whenever he was the commissioner. Remember he had the commissioner? Right. And he actually had a briefcase full of beer. It was actually a briefcase full <laughs> of beer. And um, so we, we came in and he's stunning everybody. We're all falling out of the ring and all of that. And then I go to come get him, and instead of stunning me, he turns over and hits me with that, oh. that case of beer. And I saw stars and green clovers and everything else. But, oh. you know, yeah, Steve, Steve's cool, man. I mean, he, he had to do that. He's stone cold, you know. Speaking of the attitude error, what prompted it? Was it the Montreal screw job? Vince turning heel? I think, I think that had a lot to do with it, you know. It, um, the people saw the ugly side of the business right there, you know, and so I guess it had to change, you know, people's perception changed, you know, it wasn't so much good guy versus bad guy, they saw that sometimes the good guy can actually be the bad guy in the locker room. Your thoughts as Vince, of Vince McMahon as a heel? Vince is one of the best heels that has ever been and I mean, sorry, Jr., but Vince is the best commentator that there has ever been in really? wrestling. He he did it the best. I mean, he can make you excited about looking at a mop in the corner, you know. So I got Vince is the man, man. He he's truly a genius. Your thoughts on The Rock? Highly intelligent. Um, he you talk about the it factor I mean, you look in the dictionary that his picture is there you know he he had it you know intelligence he could talk 
he was gorgeous, you and know. And, in his blood. Yeah, I mean, he was second generation, third generation, you know, it's like, he was destined for greatness, man. And I knew it from the time he was in the USWA. Did you see any jealousy between The Rock and Steve Austin? I mean, of course. I mean, you, there, there had to be some professional jealousy because they were at the time they were like almost head to head. But those guys are professionals, man. They worked it out. You know, they made a lot of money together. Did The Rock change with success as years went on? You know what? Not, not, not anything noticeable. You know, I, I couldn't say that because, yeah, you know, he was. He was always humble, you know, always humble. I, I guess uh, that has something to do with the way he was brought up, but the last time I saw him, he was still the same humble guy, you know, just a lot richer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you think that The Rock would be as big as he is today? I did. I honestly did, man, because, like I said, I had a match with him before he even stepped foot in the WWF, and... He just had it. I mean, at the time, Lex Luger was the guy that had, like, the body. And, you know, he he was, you know, right there. And he had the looks, and, you know, I knew he'd make it big, man. Not as big as he did, but I knew he'd make it big. Your thoughts on Mick Foley? <laughs> Actually, uh, Mick Foley's kid's favorite wrestler is Big Daddy V. <laughs> 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 he told me that, you know, and it's, it's, it's great, I heard man. his son Dewey likes Owen Hart. Yeah, yeah, he yeah, loves yeah. Owen too. Yeah, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's, it's good, man. Mick's a good guy. Um, the sacrifices that he's made for the business, every guy should just you know bow down to a man. How many guys can say they've jumped off the hell in the cell and went through a table? Not many. The bump he took through the cell actually got a lot more praise from the boys as opposed to being off the cage. Yeah. Right. You know what? Just incredible, man. Incredible. Uh, Pain, pain threshold he has, you know, to be able to do that. I, I can't really say which which bump was the greatest. Your thoughts on the backyard wrestling? Did um, did did Foley's bumps prompt the backyard wrestling? Like the kids getting hurt, starting their own b uh, backyard federations? Um, I don't think I wouldn't put it on Foley. I'd put it more on ECW than, than Foley, the old ECW. You think they pushed the envelope too? Yeah, I, I think they they were the ones that really uh, charged the back backyard wrestling. But I was a backyard wrestler too back in the day. <laughs> yeah, we had belts and everything. Yeah, sure <laughs> tell us more. Yeah, it, it was fun. I mean, we had uh, it was a group of kids, and you know we had our belts and we run our angles and. We'd wrestle on a uh, cardboard. <laughs> I mean, we did it big, man. It was like, you know, I, I knew at that point that I really wanted to be a wrestler. Your thoughts on D-Generation X? Like, how much heat did the company get from parents and critics, the PTC? I'm sure they got a lot, but uh, the bottom line is a dollar bill. And DX has sold more merchandise than a lot of people ever will, you know, so that's the bottom line. And people love it. It's household name, DX. Suck it. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see Triple H before he was in DX as a guy that he had the it factor, that he was going to be a major star? Kind of, sort of, man. I mean, uh, I mean, I can't talk about anybody's wrestling skills, but I didn't think that he was as, as technically sound as like a, a Kurt Henning or anything, but as far as his look, he had a look that nobody had. You know, he didn't wear his hair back then. He just, you know, you could see his hair was flowing, and he's oh, he's a beautiful guy, and you know what I mean? He's intelligent, so that'll take you somewhere. Now he's the game. Your thoughts on teaming with Minion in the in the Ministry of Darkness? I want to go back to the stable yet with Undertaker. Mm -hmm. Uh, he had a streaking gimmick, you know, like he used to streak through the crowds, yeah. things like that. Your mm -hmm. thoughts on Minion? Uh, crazy guy. I love him to death. Had a lot of fun. You know, we traveled together sometimes on the road when we were tagging up. Uh, couldn't believe that he did the naked Minion gimmick, but he did, and he had fun doing it, you know, so that just explains what kind of a guy he is. Tell us about the night Owen Hart uh, unfortunately passed when he tragically fell in the uh, Kemp Arena in Kansas City. Yeah. You actually wrestled, uh, like I think it was immediately or a couple matches after him. Yeah, I think it was a couple matches after. I was in the back. Um, I was talking to Mark Henry about whatever, and I 
A Train came up to us. I think he's called uh, Giant Bernard now in Japan. But uh, he came up to us and said, Owen just fell from the top of the arena. And Mark Henry and Owen were like very, very close. And Mark turned to him and, you know, a little explicit language told him to don't play like that, you know. And uh, he was like, man, I'm serious. He just fell from the top of the arena. So, of course, we went and tried to find a monitor and we found out that was true. Um, and they wheeled him back eventually. And, you know, you could see that he was he was dead, you know. And uh, <sighs> there was a lion on one side, a lion on the other side of people, and they just rolled him down the middle and put him in the ambulance. And, and the ambulance didn't go anywhere, you know. So it was a very tragic situation. And it was so hard to wrestle after that, you know, because you felt like you were going to die or get hurt in some way, you know. So it, it was rough, man. Do you think the show should have been stopped in hindsight? You know what? I feel like Owen would have wanted the show to go on. You know what I mean? Because think about it. You know, he, he looks what his family is, you know, the Hart family, you know, that that's a wrestling family. He would have wanted the show to go on, you know. So if that's what he would have wanted, then so be it. Can you describe the scene at Owen's funeral? There was a lot of fans. And Actually, I didn't go to the funeral, oh. yeah, um, but, you know, talking to some people that did, you know, I heard that it was, it was good, it was a nice, nice service and everything. The following night on the, um, the night after he passed, they had a tribute to Owen Hart on Raw, mm -hmm. and it got a lot of um, criticism that it was distasteful, that it was there to spike ratings. Do you think that, what, what are your feelings on that? I think it was a hell of a tribute, you know, and it was heartfelt, you know. I mean, to be in the locker room and to be in the back after that happened, it, it was it was it was kind of bad. Everybody was really depressed about it, you know, and you know that we had to deal with the press and everything. So, you know, it, that was a tragic situation. Oh, and uh, you mentioned before that he was known for pulling uh, ribs and you know harm harmless pranks. Can you share with us a couple uh, Owen stories? <laughs> Well, I know he used to always glue Mark Henry's uh, boot to the ceiling <laughs> with super glue. <laughs> and so he we used to always know it was Owen. So he'd be like, he, as soon as he'd see it, he'd start screaming, Owen, Owen, you know. So funny stuff, man, just little stuff like that, you know, just, you know, trying to be Mr. Fuji. <laughs> Mark Henry even made a, he, he read a touching poem about Owen when he spoke the following night on Raw. Yeah, heartfelt. Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, how close were was Mark and Owen? Very close, because at the time uh, Mark was coming in, you know, he was very green as a wrestler, very green to wrestling, period. And Owen really took Mark under his wing and tried to help him and show him stuff, you know, when he didn't have to. And um, that touched Mark, you know, so they became good friends. And, you know, when he died, you know, you could see with that poem that they, he really meant a lot to him. The company was moving in a much more sexually toned, uh, violent nature from your previous run. It was more family-oriented. Um, what do you What do you think about the transformation? It was cool, you know, uh, because I think that it was it, it was needed. You know, people didn't really believe in good guy, bad guy anymore. It's like nobody's all good, nobody's all bad, you know. And so, you know, they tweaked it a little bit, and uh, it became a little raunchy or whatever, but, I mean, the business was so great. People loved it. Your memories of JBL and, and Ron Simmons when they were the acolytes in your Ministry of Darkness. <laughs> Those guys, man, are, are, are totally bar <laughs> guys. I mean, they, So it's they, not a gimmick? No, it's not a gimmick at all, man. You know, uh, John Layfield, Ron Simmons, they're, they're really good friends, football guys and they can go out and they can drink anybody under the table. You know, I'm not even going to try to drink them under the table because I can't. Can you share a story with us about uh, Ron Simmons and JBL? Hmm. Well, all I can tell you is that we beat up a lot of people together. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, we, we, we had fun doing the Ministry of Darkness, but our, our whole thing was, was coming out of the crowd and, and, and jumping people in the ring. We had fun, man. We became friends, you know. Uh, 
uh, after that, you know, after being in the ministry together. So it's good to have those guys by your side and at doors. And yeah, yeah, better be on your side and against <laughs> you. Memories of winning uh, the hardcore title at WrestleMania 2000, defeating Taz. It was good, man, because uh, at the time, Taz was like the ECW guy coming into uh, WWE at the time, WWF. Right, he was there uh, only a short period of time before yeah, WrestleMania. Yeah, and so, I mean, it was an honor to beat Taz because he was truly like the hardcore king at the time, you know. And, uh, you know, that, that, was, that was an honor, man, to be the first African-American hardcore champion. Do you think it devalued the hardcore title, the title changed so many hands that night? I did. I did, and I hated to see that because I love hardcore wrestling. I wish they would have kept that title more seriously. It's like whenever they gave it to, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, when they gave it to Crash Holly, uh, I felt like the, the title became kind of a joke. And before then, it was really taken serious, you know, as, as a hardcore champion, you know. WrestleMania was uh, your last high-profile match at this point in your career in 2000. Uh, you wrestled some TV tapings for Sunday Night Heat, and you wrestled a lot of house shows. Um, did you see the writing on the wall? Well, actually, uh, what had happened is I got hurt. I separated my shoulder real bad, and uh, by the time, you know, I got where I wanted to come back, they had gone a different direction. And that happens sometimes in professional wrestling. I mean, if you get hurt, and you know you're on the sidelines a guy could come in there and and take your spot and then when you're ready there's no spot for you it happens so it's just a victim of circumstance no hard feelings man how competitive was it between all the boys like you know with all the you know limited spots and now you're in a monday night wars you know attitude era back then we didn't have uh trainers and and people bringing us stuff and taping us up and sewing us up you had what you had in your bag and that's it, you know what I mean? So we had to take care of ourselves, you know what I mean? And so it was really a, a man's sport back then. And, and if you got hurt, you didn't get paid. So you had to fight for the top, you know? When did you know you were getting released for the second time with uh, WWE? Um, basically, when I, whenever I got hurt, and, and they were dragging their feet about bringing me back and they wanted me to go to the training camp and, and work with the, the, the younger kids. I kind of knew that, you know, that run was coming to an end. But I knew there'd be another time. Talk about tough enough. Does um, something like that irritate you? You paid your dues for so long and now you see that you see fresh set of kids coming in, 13 weeks they could train and then they're a professional wrestler, they get a contract? Yeah, I mean, of course that's controversial to any wrestler. You know what I mean? All, all the sacrifices we go through to get to the point of the week, you know, get to, you know, to make some money and, you know, it's a long, hard process to make it to the top. And then for somebody to come along and make it that easy, of course, it's going to rub people the wrong way. But having said that, Maven, man, me and him became very good friends uh, when he was in uh, WWE, and we used to travel together, party together. Maven's real cool, man, and, you know, he actually deserves what he got, you know, because he's a good dude. Yeah. Where have you gone from 2000? I was doing mostly uh, wrestling overseas, and I was doing military bases with international championship oh, yeah. wrestling, yeah. We used to go over to Guam and, and uh, South Korea and Japan and Hawaii, you know, so I did that for a while, which was very rewarding. I got a lot of medals, you know, for doing those shows, you know, and uh, it was good, but it got to a point where I really wanted to go back, and uh, that's when I gave them a call, and uh, they came up with the angle with Gangrel, who was on the tour with me as well and uh, they made us a tag team. You also wrestled uh, for MCW during this point. Yeah, I was, I was wrestling for MCW. Yeah, yeah, I was a champion there, and uh, then I moved on and I started doing uh, international military bases. You wrestled for TNA uh, when they were NWA TNA for, uh, for two shows, mm -hmm. when they were an upstart company. Uh, you worked with Ron Kellings, yep. is that correct? Yeah. Uh, what are you? What's up? What's up? <laughs> <laughs> what are your feelings on uh, TNA coming in? Um, your company. I figured that it would just be another USWA, 
uh, they told me they wanted to bring me in for a couple of weeks and, and they didn't promise anything after that and you know I didn't want to just be exclusive that you know I just wanted to try it a couple of weeks like they said and you know that was that you know you made a your third run uh, in 2004 you came back as a hired gun uh, from JBL when he was feuding with The Undertaker. Mm -hmm. When did you get the call? Um, actually, I had been keeping in touch with them for about a year as I was doing the international tours. And, um, you know, they were trying to come up with something, you know, but it takes time. And so they called me and, and uh, gave me the idea about, you know, me and Gangrel. We were supposed to have been the ministry and be a tag team. But, you know, for some reason, they, they switched me to Raw and, and they never did anything else with Gangrel. Right. They switched you right. from Raw. Uh, then you did an angle, like, uh, with Trish Stratus and Kane and Alita. Yeah, the smile, <laughs> I could see the right? smiles, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that, uh, that kicked off the world's largest love machine. Yeah, that, that was actually a fluke how that even came along because Hunter had got hurt. That's when he hurt his, his thigh muscle. Right. So that opened up a lot of uh, TV time for them to try some things. And Vince had an idea for uh, me to do this deal with Trish, you know. And at the time, I was just like, you know, formerly of the, of, uh, the ministry, just a ghoul, right. you know. And uh, so we did it, man. And, and Trish is so great to work with. And we just kicked it. And we were... We were doing it great, man. It's like we were getting all our stuff done in one take. It was like so natural, and you know, the love machine was born. That's where you kissed Trish Stratus. Yeah. And uh, what was it like to kiss Trish Stratus? If you don't mind. <laughs> and could you imagine? And they paid me to do that. You know what I'm saying? So it's, it's it was great, man. She uh, she has some very soft lips. I'll put it like that. <laughs> Um, after you moved on from your feud uh, with Kane and Lita, along with Trish, you moved on to uh, Lillian Garcia. Uh, you adopted the new look, you wore the baggy pajamas, and proclaimed that you had an appetite for love. Right. Uh, whose idea was it? You mentioned to Vince and he wanted to, you know. Yeah, uh, Vince came up with the idea and it was actually Stephanie was the one that told me what you know the look should be because I was trying to figure out exactly what I wanted to wrestle in and so um, I talked to her about the pajamas and the smoking jacket and she was she was feeling that you know and um, what fun I had with that gimmick what fun what did you think about working with uh, Lillian Garcia the ring announcer it was such a good relationship. It was it was always great to see her every day. It was like we were really in a relationship, but we weren't, you know. But in a way, we were, because we were working every day together. And um, it's a funny thing, because when I told her that they were going to stop the angle and we were going our separate ways, she was really upset about it. And whenever we did the pay-per-view and the world saw her cry, they saw that she was really upset about the angle being stopped. So. She played it really well, too. Uh, I don't think she was playing, bro. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there was actually the angle that um, for weeks that you were trying to get with Lillian, and uh, she even she started to warm up to you. She proposed to you on uh, on the pay-per-view. Right. And I believe it was earlier, but then on the pay-per-view you, you were going to accept, and then the Godfather came out and brought the hose. And right, <laughs> and I chose the hose yeah, over her. Yeah, right. Yeah. And then she cried, and she cried. And was that the original plan? Um, I don't know. They were, like I said, they were like winging that. You know, the the whole love machine thing was like, okay, let's try this, let's try that. And then it just got to the point where they wanted to, to separate me and Lillian, so that's how they did it, you know. But the love machine kept going. After the the storyline with Lillian ended, you were paired with Val Venus to form the tag team V Squared. Uh, you teamed together for nearly nine months, actually, and you challenged for the World Tag Team straps as well. Mm -hmm. What was it like uh, teaming with Val? It was fun because uh, as soon as they turned me into the love machine, I thought it was a given that we would eventually tag up, and I told Val that. I said, they'll probably tag us up one day, and sure enough, they <laughs> did, you know. And we had a lot of fun, man, you know, swiveling the hips and right. girls screaming and stuff. Fun, man. That was really fun teaming with Val. 
When Val was, uh, he was legitimately hurt uh, in April of 2006. Was he injured? Uh, yeah, his elbow. His he, elbow. Yeah, he started to uh, get uh, numbness in his fingers and he had to get it corrected. So you went back to being a singles wrestler again? Right, right. right. Uh, first angle back from the singles, you were back with Lillian Garcia, actually. Yeah. And uh, you wanted to get back with her, and she said, the last time you dumped me, you know. Right, right, so, yeah. right, right. <laughs> And uh, that was uh, the birth of Umaga, pretty much. Right, yeah. Umaga, that was yeah. my next one. So uh, what was Umaga like coming in? He's cool, man. Actually, uh, He actually came in earlier as a three-minute warning. But, yeah. yeah, a funny story is uh, we, we were traveling together, Umaga and uh, Mike Yoda, myself, and Gene Snitsky. And um, he was wanting to get his, his face done before we got to the arena because that's what he was told to do and so I actually from the front seat turned around and was drawing on his face with a sharpie <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah that's that's a funny story that that, that uh, about a manga. Charlie Haas got involved in the angle as well he was vying for uh, Lillian's affection yeah and then uh, she turned you both down said she just wanted to be friends right right so uh, and then you both turned on her, you yeah. and Charlie. So yeah. um, then you began tag teaming with him. What was that like? It was fun, man. Me and Charlie became real close being a tag team. We traveled together as well as, you know, being a tag team. And we had some good matches with uh, uh, on the road with Flair and, uh, and Hunter and then sometimes with Flair and Triple H. And, uh, I mean, that was, I mean, my memory of being a tag team with Charlie, the highlight was, was actually getting into the ring and wrestling Ric Flair. So, that was great. Yeah, um, Vince said he wanted me to get rid of the mohawk, get rid of the contacts, you know, and grow my hair out. He asked me, could I grow a full head of hair? Because, he, I mean, you wear a mohawk for 15 years, who knows, you know? But yeah, I told him I could grow a full head of hair, and uh, he told me he, what he wanted to do with me and uh, how he wanted me to change my dress, and that's when we kind of bunted heads a little bit. I mean, it was great because uh, before then, everybody was afraid of the worms, Booker T, and, and everybody, you know, uh, they was really pushing the boogeyman. And they uh, they just brought me in and just let me kill him, you know. And and he was a good guy and a very business about it, you know. He's a very good friend of mine. And I I just want to thank him for allowing you know Big Daddy V to get over like that. Who came up with the name Big Daddy V? Actually, Vince. Yeah, Vince came up with that. Yeah, he came up with the with the whole scenario, you know. So that's another one of his creations. About the ring attire, he wanted me to come out like you know Steve Austin with just the little trunks on. That's that's what he wanted. And for six months, I, I resisted it, and I was like, come on, Vince, let's negotiate down. And eventually, we negotiated to the Big Daddy V look. He just wanted me to come out in, in tights and, and boots, that's it, you know? And uh, I wasn't comfortable with that, you know what I mean? Because uh, you got to get out there and wrestle. So, you know, we negotiated down. And at the time, it was true yeah. until Big Daddy V came on the scene and the ratings went up. At the time, NBC was going to drop uh, ECW because the ratings were so low. Sci-fi? Yeah, yeah, and, and uh, NBC owns the, the whole right. whatever. And uh, so whenever I came on the scene for a few weeks and the ratings jumped up, you know, they, they re-signed ECW. I'm not saying I did it alone because it's a team effort, but hey, I was there. Right, it's like, uh, it shows just the different facets of me, you know, I had people captivated with the love machine, you know, I was a lover and kissing and, you know, singing and romancing and all that, and then just to be able to flip it on you and, and be this total different character. It's like for a, a minute people were asking, was that, is that really Viss or is that some other guy, you know? Did you find your look as Big Daddy V unique? Very, very, because uh, the tattoos hurt to get done you know they mean a lot to me and uh you know it makes for a hell of an action figure too so i'm cool <laughs> <laughs> how many tattoos did you get after the changes of the new character 
actually I was getting those tattoos made during the whole time I was the love machine and you couldn't see because I had on the pajamas but at, I was getting everything done during that period. My tattoos reflect nothing about wrestling. It, it's more of a spiritual thing, and I think if you if you look at them closely, you'll see what I'm talking about. You know, but you know the tattoos are they're special to me. Well, yeah, I felt like the ball was dropped right there, but it was a, it was a situation where I was hot at the time, but CM Punk was hot too. Right. You know. And um, you know they 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 set the match up where both of us would look good in the end. You know he kept the belt, but I dominated everything. You know so I guess it was a win-win situation. But I think the fans really wanted to see you know CM Punk chase Big Daddy B instead right. of the other way around. Did they ever tell you you'd be ECW champion? I was never told that. No. So what were the plans after uh, CM Punk? Were there going to be any rematches, return matches? You know what? They wanted to move me to SmackDown. That was before they started shifting talent. I was the first one because I was really too big for ECW just to stay there, you know? So they moved me on to SmackDown, and uh, I was ECW, but I was more SmackDown. Did you like that you're going to be moved to uh, SmackDown? Now you have the Undertaker there. You're you're no stranger to the Undertaker and yeah, it other was, guys. It was exciting. You know, I, I saw opportunity there. You know, but um, I really did want to run with that ECW championship. Yeah, I sure did. Now this is a rumor on the internet, but is this true that before you went to SmackDown, that they they told you the company told you to go home and they told you you had to lose some weight? That's absolutely false. false. I, I've been wanting to say that forever because it's been all over the internet. That was never told to me. And the only reason why I got off of the road is because I had pneumonia for like two months on the road, walking pneumonia. And, and that's the reason why I was off the road. Give us the full scoop on your WWE release in um, 2008. What happened is I was on the road with pneumonia and I didn't know it but it got to a point where I started to feel really bad and my wife begged me to go to the doctor, which I did. You know, wrestlers, the way we feel is if we can walk, then we can wrestle. That's our philosophy, but that didn't work for me that time. I was very sick. They told me I had to go into the hospital. It was two weeks before WrestleMania. So long story short, whenever I was ready to come back, my doctor buried me and put WWE in a position where they were forced to release me due to medical reasons. And they told me if I just go out, wrestle for six months or two a year, to make sure I'm okay and they'll bring me back. The very next day I got a call from Hollywood. So it was uh, your doctor's fault? Ed. My doctor got me fired, absolutely. You were told to lose weight? That never happened. That never happened. I mean, my weight was never an issue. It, it, I got sick. I was sick. I had to go into the hospital two weeks before WrestleMania. I had to risk, miss WrestleMania. And then ultimately, my doctor got me fired for making certain comments that can't be ignored legally by WWE. So did you had a plan to be at WrestleMania? Did they have any opponents in mind for you? Yeah, I was supposed to be in the Battle Royal, and I was supposed to be in the end of it with Kane. I was going to get a huge push. And that's uh, WrestleMania 24 in Orlando is right, what we're talking about. Right. Yeah. What your thoughts on Vince McMahon's work ethic? Bar none. Bar none, man. He, he's the mind behind this business. Like I said, anybody else that's trying to do it, uh, just covering copies of Vince McMahon because he is the brains behind this business. Do you see Stephanie and Shane as individuals who would carry the company like their father? Yes, actually, Stephanie is just like Vince. Yeah. You know, she's just a female. And uh, and Shane, you know, he's always been right there, you know. So, I mean, I got much love for the McMahons. You know, they've done a lot for me and my family, you know. And the Vince has always been straight up with me. So, I mean, I don't see how anybody could dog the McMahons, you know, in any form. I mean, for helping you provide for your family and do what you love at the same time. Your thoughts on Triple H? today? Triple H is the most smartest man in the history of the business. Why is that? Hey, man, I mean, <laughs> he's in the business. I mean, he's in the family. 
how how much smarter can you be? You know what I mean? He, I mean, you win. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about the game. Yeah. Thoughts on uh, John Cena? John Cena, man, uh, is more dedicated to wrestling than anybody else I've ever met. You know, it's like he lives it, breathes it, 24/7, man, and doesn't mind it at all. You know, he, he's uh, talk about the hardest working man in show business. John Cena is right up there. Did you see him as a potential future superstar? Um, no, I didn't because the gimmick that he had, the the white boy rapper right. thing, I didn't think that that would really blow up like it did, you know. But I did know that he had a good personality in the back and that he had a good body and he, you know, he had plenty of potential. Give us your final thoughts of The Undertaker today in general. Undertaker is a, a cornerstone of this business. I really think that he had the opportunity uh, back when WCW was a rival. I think if, if he would have left WWF, WCW would have won. I honestly feel that way. And so I felt like he saved the company. He's a cornerstone. He's a leader. Got a ton of respect for him, man. Can't wait to get in the ring with him again. Could you touch on the subject exactly? What is Wrestler's Court? Wrestler's Court is when uh, you do something out of line that all wrestlers will, will disapprove of and you have to get in front of uh, your peers and plead your case and it's actually like court. You have a judge, you have uh, lawyers, I mean you have to be there to, to know what I mean and you have to witness it yourself but it's real court, it's just wrestlers involved. And who would be the judge? Probably Taker. Taker? Yeah. Is he the judge during execution everybody says? Uh, he's, he's, yeah. yeah, he's got the power. Thoughts on Batista? Dave. Dave is cool, man. He, he's the kind of guy that you want to be on top, you know. He's, uh, you know, I like going out partying with him, you know what I'm saying. He's a ton of fun, and, you know, he's just a cool person. And, and overseas and all around the world, like, people, they really love him because he has that look, you know. He's the man. Thoughts on MVP on Televontavious Porter? An incredible dude, man. Did nine years in prison. You know, got out, got into wrestling, is doing it big, man. You know, he uh, he had to take two steps backwards to take that one big step forward, and he's he's going the right direction. He has his head on top, head on straight, and you'll see him in the main event soon, I'm sure. Your thoughts on Ring of Honor? I don't really know much about Ring of Honor, but what I do know is that a lot of great wrestlers have come from there. Samoa Joe, CM Punk, you know, the list goes on and on, but uh, it's an interesting place. I'd like to know more about it, so yeah. What are your thoughts on TNA and its uh, current product right now? I like Jeff Jarrett, you know. Um, he knows the business. He's a brilliant guy and everything, uh, but I just see it as a carbon copy of the real thing, you know, and, and there's no disrespect to nobody. You know, but uh, the WWE is just, that is wrestling. It always has been and always will be, and, you know, that's just the way I see it. Would you ever work for TNA if they called? Um, or you never say never in this You business. never say never in the business. That's first right. and foremost, but I would say that uh, I am a WWE guy, you know. Absolutely. Do you miss wrestling? The money, yes. The pain, no. The travel, no. Being away from my family, no. What about the locker room? Yeah, I miss my boys. You know, I mean, it, we, we lean on each other, man. You know, in, in times of need, you know, uh, long tours, you know, 17-day tours overseas. It's like you got to make fun out of that because that's a lot of hard work. You still keep in touch with a, a lot of the... I sure do, I sure do. I send all of them Christmas cards and we always, you know, keep in touch and make sure everybody's still breathing. I mean, you're family, you know, you're more family than your family because you spend so much time together. Who's the first guy that called you when you got released? Man, I don't even know who the first one was because it, it, it was a, a barrage of calls, you know what I mean? But which one stuck out of your mind? Matt Strike was really hurt really hurt, you know, 
because we are really good friends, you know what I mean? And we had a good thing going, you know, that, that that's really untapped, you know. But, you know, I'm glad to see that he's found his niche as a commentator. He's actually doing quite a great job. He's doing an excellent job, and, uh, and I wish him all the best. What is the biggest misconception about you? Hmm. The biggest misconception about me. Hmm. Can I take a chance to think about that sure. for a minute? Sure. <laughs> um, I guess the biggest misconception about me is that I'm a one dimensional person because uh, just like you can see with all my characters that I brought to life and, and got them all over, it's like as many facets as there are five different characters, there's a little bit of me in every one of those characters. Which of the three characters, uh, Mabel, King Mabel, Viscera, Big Daddy V, which one was your favorite personally? The one that is most close to me is the love machine <laughs> because course. Vince McMahon just saw me showing up to work every day dressed like I dress, looking the way I look, being the way I am, and he got an idea. You actually surprised a lot of the fans when you were singing on Raw one, uh, one night to Lillian Garcia. That was actually, they, they wanted me to, uh, the writers had gave me lyrics that they wanted me to sing. And they wanted me to sing about eating cheeseburgers and, and make a joke out uh -huh. of it. And when I went out on live TV, I flipped it on them and I just sang the song and put Lillian in it, sang Barry White's song and put Lillian's name in it. You sung Can't Get Enough of Your Love. Lillian, yeah, right. right. And, uh, and I got an ovation. The people were like, that guy can sing, you know. And that was nerve-wracking, too. That was my first time ever singing on live TV. And you actually TV. laid down on a bed. Like yeah, you had a bed yeah, in we the had ring. a bed in the yeah, ring. Yeah, right. yeah. Thoughts on the newsletters and the Internet? I think it's hurt the business. I definitely think it's hurt the business. It's, it's out of control. You know, um, the fans are really taking away from their self-reading these spoilers and all this stuff, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I don't think that there, there's, there can be any stop to it or it can be tamed in any way, but um, it's just something that is here and we have to deal with it. Why is it taking you so long to do a shoot interview? It's taking me so long because I've gotten offers from other companies to uh, do shoot interviews and I have seen some of their products and some of their exploitations as I see it. And um, until I met this company, I've never considered doing one because the production wasn't up to par and I mean, it, I just didn't want to be associated with anything uh, I considered to be low life. And that's what I considered those other companies to be. So. I'm glad that we're doing this here. I welcome you. I appreciate that. What is the highest payday that you've got? Um, like I said, I don't like to discuss numbers because I think that's, you know, a little tacky. Not numbers, but, but you know, ballpark figure. What year would, would you say that stuck out and says, wow, I was, I was the man. This is it. Um, 95 was, was definitely a good year. And, uh, my biggest payday would have to be uh, tens of thousands, I'll say that. For one particular For event? For one night. The WrestleMania? Uh, actually, no, the King of the Ring. King of the Ring. Yeah. Which locker room of the three eras were your favorites? My favorite locker room was the Attitude Era. The Attitude Era. Why no, is that? No drug test. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, no, in, no dress code. Uh, no really time to be there you just it was just a wild time where money was really flowing and the business was hot and you just uh you just got on and rolled that wave was 1995 the best time of your career um no it wasn't because i was i was immature and and i didn't know how to handle what was being given to me, so I would have to say 1995 was not my greatest year in wrestling. Well, what was? Uh, maybe the years that I kissed Lillian and Trish. <laughs> <laughs> Can you give us some good ribs that were pulled? Can you name one? 
You know what? Um, as far as me, I have never been ribbed, and I've never ribbed anybody. But I've seen some uh, some pretty bad ones. I think the the actual worst one. Uh, I won't say who did it, but uh, Lex Luger had ordered some noodles when we were overseas. You know, to be at his room by the time he got there. Well, somebody saw it first and knew it was his room, and they put a little brown surprise underneath the pasta. Oh, my God. And he didn't notice it until he was stirring it up. You know, it's kind of gross, but ribs get deep, bro. <laughs> Did he eat it, or he... No, he was, oh. you know how you prepare your right, food, and you're, right. like, mixing it up, and you know, oh, my God. And then, so... <laughs> What were some of the guys you traveled with, like, in the cars, like the car rides, you know? For the uh, first few years, uh, it was strictly men on a mission. You know, we were always together in a four Taurus, you know, instant tenant windows when we got in there, you know. <laughs> so, and, uh, you know, eventually, uh, the longer you stay in it, you want to travel by yourself. And then you meet the guys at the bars or whatever. You all go your separate ways, so. Your favorite person to work with and why? My favorite person that I worked with would have to be Bam Bam because I was learning so much, you know, and uh, at a time when I really needed to learn, you know, so I'd have to say Bam Bam Bigelow. Your least favorite person to work with? Least favorite person to work with? Um, man, that's tough because I like to wrestle, you know what I mean? It's like as long as you get in there and wrestle. Not personally, but in terms of like maybe they're difficult to work with or... Hmm. I honestly can't think of anybody that I could just pick out. I mean, and that's the truth, you know. That's fair. As long as, I guess anybody that would get into the ring with me timid, and I can't really just think of anybody right now, but, you know, anybody that would get in there with a weak front mind frame. Has anyone ever tried to take liberties with you in the ring? Or even dare tried? Uh, Ken Shamrock. Ken Shamrock has? Yeah. Yeah, he put me in the ankle lock and he cranked it, and uh, you know, things happen. You know, <laughs> you know that was when I came back. You want to elaborate on that? Yeah, the King versus King match. Right, you were that about match. It, that yeah. match. The yeah, brief stint you had. Yeah. Yeah, and so you know they they wanted uh, him to hold the ankle lock on me, and the referees come, he still won't break it. You know, and so while he was holding it, he was cranking it. He was cranking it really good. And it felt like my ankle was on fire. You know. But, uh, was there know, anything before that that happened? Maybe like in the locker room, or you talk? About I think it? at the time the guys uh, got in Kenny's head, and, and it was like, hey, you know, he's hurt a few people, blah 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 blah, and so I guess he kind of, you know, did whatever. But you know, we buried the hatchet, and we're cool now, right. so it's no big deal. There's water under the bridge, bro. If there's any wrestler dead or alive in his prime that you could headline WrestleMania with, who would it be, and why? Andre the Giant. Because uh, he he was just he was just such a, a phenomenal person, you know what I mean? And just I would love to have gotten in there with him and just to show my agility and and to really bump good for him, you know, because you know I could have. And so yeah, Andre, man. How about somebody who's uh, smaller? Like you mentioned, the David and Goliath. That you preferred that? Um, I always wanted to have a one-on-one -on -one match with Jeff Hardy. Because I've had tag matches with him, and, you know, and he's real smooth in the ring, and I just felt like, you know, we could have a, a good match because he's a high flyer, and I'll do a little high flying here and there, too, and I think it'll make for a good match. You mentioned Jeff along with Matt in the early years when they used to carry you in the King of the Ring. Yeah. Uh, talk about Matt and Jeff. Man, those, those are two guys that really came from the bottom and went all the way to the top, man. I mean, dudes. they used to come in as enhancement talent, you know, and they worked their way right. up from there. You know, they were taking me to the ring, and, you know, I mean, look at what they've accomplished, man. Hats off to the hardest. Advice for the young guys wanting to break into the business? Well, get ready for a lifetime of pain, you know. That's guaranteed, you know. If you can deal with that and deal with being away from your family that you love, then, hey, maybe you'll be a great professional wrestler. But if not, go the other way. If there's anything that you can go back and change, what would it be? The way I allowed the King of the Ring Championship to destroy me and Mo's friendship, because we were best friends. 
and you know we're not enemies now but we're not best friends now either you know and that's the only thing you're saying the king of the ring got to your head no the king oh. of the ring they put me on a pedestal and they put mo down right and he in turn it's got jealousy it yeah time. exactly it's professional right, jealousy you right. know what i mean i didn't know how to deal with professional jealousy at the time you know so if i could go back and change anything i would change the way i dealt with his professional jealousy we understand that uh, you're going to be on the big screen in two major movies coming up one is a national lampoon's movie uh legend of awesome is maximus yeah. describe your character in the movie and uh, uh, well, first of all, it's, uh, it's called 301, The Legend of Awesomeness Maximus. Oh, okay. It's, it's a spoof of the movie 300. Okay. Like scary movie and those right, scary right. movies. And uh, my character's name is Ginormous. He's uh, the biggest, baddest warrior of one army. And then there's another ultimate warrior of another army. And it's very funny, you know, I have some funny lines. I want everybody to go out and see it and support Russell that. Peters is actually in that movie and, uh, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, the midget from Bad Santa. And, yeah. Uh, the, the, the director was uh, Mr. Canoe, the guy that uh, directed the Rocky movie, the original Rocky movie. Is that, is that movie finished right now or they're still filming? It, it is in post-production. It'll be in theaters soon. Uh, and how did you get uh, involved with the movies? Actually, like I said, when uh, my doctor got me fired from WWE, the very next day they called me and said they had a movie for me if I wanted it, and if they wanted more, if I wanted to do more movies, then they could help me with that. And so I did the movie, and you know they said, okay, so what do you want to do with the rest of your career? Do you want to wrestle? Do you want to act? Do you want to do a little bit? Of, and I said, I would like to mainly act. And I have some very good people helping me, and things are going good with it. And that's the reason why, at this time, I have no aspirations on going back to WWE at the time. And it didn't end there, because now you're in uh, another movie, as we understand it, with Nick Cage in a movie called Kick-Ass. Yeah, well, that's that's up in the air right now. I don't want to say that, oh, okay. you know, that's locked. So there's nothing that's official, not, okay. Yeah, that's not locked in okay. right now, but we have a, a few more projects that we're working on, too. But, okay. yeah, you'll definitely see me on the big screen. That's excellent. Congratulations. Yes, sir. So, is this uh, your current goal right now, the movies? Or you mentioned that you're, you're leaving that on the table to go back to WWE and yeah well uh, not only movies but I have like the television projects a couple offers that came in about you know co-hosting a uh, game show and things of this nature so I'm not really putting a cap on anything I just know that uh, I'm enjoying going into other forms of entertainment as opposed to you know bumping every night and coming home hurt and you know making my wife sad you know so she's very happy with you know what i'm doing and so i'm happy your final words to all your fans it's been a long 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 road you know um, a lot of people have grown up watching me and there's a new generation that that know know me in a different character but you know I have a lot of fans around the world, and I acknowledge them, and I, you know, I see them, and I appreciate them, you know, and and I will eventually one day return to wrestling in some form, but right now you're gonna have to watch for me on the big screen and the TV doing other things, and I'll be back. I it's been be a back. pleasure very much. Thank you Thank for joining you. us. Absolutely, sir.